Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I am Ray, your audiobook reviewer, and I will be reviewing some recent and classic Lit RPG audiobooks for you. What I'm going to begin with is Restart, Level Up Series, Book 1, written by Dan Sugrilinov, translated by Irene and Neil P. Woodhead, narrated by Ramon D. Ocampo, with a book length of 15 hours and 3 minutes. Although admittedly euphoric, I wasn't in a hurry to actually hit the books. Over the course of those five days, my enthusiasm had finally worn thin, leaving me in the same place as before. When finally I forced myself to sit down and actually study, I quickly felt sad and bored. By the end of the second day, I realized... I wasn't cut out for this sort of thing. I spent the next year scraping by on my meager blog advertising income and doing occasional freelance jobs. Yana, my wife, still had faith in me and my supposed potential, but her patience was already dwindling. Eight years my junior, she was at an age when all her friends were discussing the best shopping and vacation destinations, while the best she could do was accompany her blogger husband to an occasional closed movie preview. Anyone can lose faith under these circumstances. Well, I have to admit, this book really made me change my tune. I would have never, ever have thought that I would actually enjoy a book that was a slice of life. But that's really all this book is, as it just follows around this average schlub named Phil, who is in a loveless marriage, he's unemployed, and he has no real ambitions in life. Phil suddenly finds himself awakened. He is awakened to the realization that he is actually in a game and that he can level up and gain skills and make friends and influence people with his abilities and knowledge that they don't have. They don't have that access. Um, And that's really all the book is about. I mean, honestly, Phil slowly turns his life around one step at a time through meaningful social interactions. And that's it. There's no big boss fight. There is absolutely no um, struggles or battles where, you know, we're... Blood is shed and life is lost. There is some some bits where his pride or ego gets bruised, uh, and that does play into it. But it's just very much real to life in that aspect of things. Not very often are you involved in a day to day basis some sort of life or death struggle. Uh, here, you know, Phil he just goes through his days uh, trying to improve himself. Once he realizes he's in the game, and that's what really really stunned me was Dan Sugarlinov made a book about going to the gym and buying an apartment and getting a dog and making friends really exciting. I mean, honestly, if you had told me I would even read a book like this, let alone loved it, I would have thought you were insane. I read fantasy and sci-fi to avoid all the mundane stuff that goes on in my life, like buying a dog or getting an apartment. Honestly, reading about a dude going to his estranged wife's hotel room in the middle of the night to make sure she is safe, is not exactly something that I would even have glanced at. But dang, if Sugarlinov did not keep me hooked the entire time. From start to finish, the book's premise was solid, it was fun, it was exciting, and it kept me interested. And that is not something a slice of life usually does to me. I mean, a slice of life book usually makes me feel like the, the, the tires are spinning and you're going nowhere. And I really... I really am not a big fan of those. And I know Ramon loves slice of life books and I don't know what his review was for this, but I'm guessing, I'm hoping it was really, really high because this is a fantastic book. I I really, really enjoyed this. I mean, I I can't say that enough. Uh, The premise is pretty brilliant and it's handled really adeptly and wisely. And he manages to balance real world antics with game elements so that at no point was I ever bored or wishing for my life to end as so many books do to me at some points. I mean, I actually cared about Phil and got mad right along with him as something crappy would happen. And I hate to admit it, but the book was a roller coaster that went from highs to lows really fast. So you kind of had to brace yourself because just as he would get here, something would happen and drop down. And again, that's, that's, that's just life in general. Now, that doesn't happen to you as often, I would hope, where you have something great happen and then something really horrible happens to balance it out. Uh, you know, instant karma kind of sucks. Uh, but I have to say, this, this 
really, really kept me on the edge of my seat as it was going through. And I don't talk like a, a nail biter, but I just wanted to see what was going to happen next. What was Phil going to do? How was Phil going to uh, alleviate this problem? What was he going to have happen with the police? You know, that sort of thing. It was just really intense, and it kept me on the hook the entire time. Now, the narration was above average, but again, I wasn't overwhelmed. I have pretty high standards now. I mean, I'm used to Hayes and Podell and Daniels, Parse now, Parse now, Parse Snow. I'm so sorry, Andrea. Renee, um, Scarlato, Toma, um, the girls from SBT, you know, Annie and Lori, uh, Justin Thomas James. Those people are like my benchmark for what narration should be. And, I mean, hearing this, I have to say, he, you know, it makes it makes a good narrator sound weaker than he really is, he or she really is, because those people just, they are such fantastic experts in their fields that they make everybody else who's not on their level just seem like, meh, and, and that's, that's what it's like. It takes a lot to impress me now. Uh, Ramon Biocampo does do a nice job and manages to add vocal elements such as voices and emotions, and he has nice pacing. Again, I just think he did uh, a nice job. Uh, nothing wrong with that. It was very adequate. It was very enjoyable. I didn't hate his work. If he did, if I did, I would have just said this book was drugged down by his trans uh, not his translations, but by his narrations. Uh, the translations are where I kind of get stumped up on. Um, I don't understand why there's there always seems to be like two or three narrators. Now here I go. There are two or three translators for these books that come from Russia. Uh, you know, I think the best thing you could do is get one person to translate it and maybe somebody else to come back and proof it. And I think that's where a lot of these issues that I have with it come into is um, there are things that just don't make sense translation-wise. Um, one line that just stands out in my head was, we made it back home without any further innuendo. Now, there was literally no innuendo before that statement was made. And again, that statement was made again later. Some things I think just got misunderstood or mixed up. And I have to wonder if these translators ever looked at the actual spirit of the sentence or just the words. I mean, I've studied Latin in ASL and, and my, my high school Latin teacher, Mrs. Dahl, she would always say, you know, you needed to see the bigger picture when translating. You couldn't look at a sentence word by word and get it right. There was a lot more to it. And I think that's what's kind of happened here. Is they just kind of go on, this word is this, this is this, this is this. But still, overall, the translation's pretty smooth. There were a couple hiccups, and that's that's all I wanted to point out. I mean, nothing horrible, but it did, it did make me take a little sliver off because of that. I just get, get crazy when I know the translator, if they're... English-speaking people would know the word innuendo does not fit in that sentence, and they should have found something that did, uh, but they just didn't. And that, to me, that just seems a little lazy, or it's incompetence, and I don't know which it would be. Uh, I loved every minute of this book. I don't want to uh, make you forget that. I want to stress it. It had a real heart, very much so, and it made me enjoy my everyday life. Uh, in fact, I, I might actually want to get everyday life's kind of stories and read those now. I don't know. I really have struggled with slice of life tales in the past, and I'm sure I'm going to in the future. But I will say that this book did actually make me uh, consider that I might want to start living my life like I was in a video game. But then I realized two things. First, I'd have to go to the gym, and and I, I just nah, uh, I just can't do that. And and uh, and the other thing is, is I already lived my life by code based on a cherished movie. And, and I don't want to go changing my lifestyle creeds midstream. You know, I'm getting 50 now. So, you know, pretty soon it's going to be midway. Probably a lot closer to like three quarters of the way. But either way, um, changing my credo just does not fit at this point in time. But I do think that the fact that it influenced me to even think that for a minute was a pretty strong indication of how good the book really was. My final score is an 8.4. Uh, it's a strong book. It, it, for a first book in the series, it looks to be like an amazing series. Uh, I, I want another slice of life of this series to come out as soon as possible. 
I enjoyed this immensely, and I cannot wait to see where it goes. And one thing that I do enjoy about uh, Dan himself is that he realizes that the longer a book series go goes, the, the more it peters out. And so, you know, he does Dark Herbalist, and he, he's like pretty much the book that I'm writing right now that's going to be coming out soon. That's the end. So, you know, he has a beginning and a middle and an end in mind when he does his stories. So I know this is not going to be one of those endless, never-ending tales. And I really appreciate that. I really do. I think that, you know, even if you have 12 books planned in a series, great. Run with it. Do those 12 and then call it quits. I, I really do not like to see, like, you know, uh, Pierce Anthony's Xanth series that just went on and on and on until he stopped writing stories and just started writing puns. And it was just horrible. It, it, it just it devolved into this massive mess. And his willingness to say, I'm going to draw a line and here it is, that impresses me even more because that's hard to do. You know, If you've got a really strong selling series, which I know a lot of people love Dark Herbalists, say, or Reality Benders, uh, why would you ever give that up? Because the story dictates it be done. That's why. And, and that's the way he feels about it. And I, I concur wholeheartedly. So, uh, again, final score is 8.4. I, I don't see how you cannot enjoy this book. Even if you don't like Slice of Life as much as I don't like Slice of Life, I think you'll enjoy this book. So, the next book I'm going to be doing is How to Train Your Kaiju. Kaiju Wars Offline, book one. And that's a very important part of the title, Offline, by Nicholas Knight, narrated by Ethan Jesse, with a book length of seven hours and one minute. It's cold. The whole prison is cold. Prisons are like hospitals that way. The big man stands from his chair and offers me his thick hand. I take it. His grip is weak, no surprise, and his fingers are cold. Aaron Moretti, he says with a smile. His voice is gentle. It's like someone gave satin sheets a voice. A pleasure to make your acquaintance. My name is Dr. Warden. I smirk. Not to be confused with our prison warden. He laughs too hard at my lame joke. <laughs> no, no, indeed not. Please have a seat. So this book was an utter conundrum for me. Uh, so much so that I think... This is one of those books that I would actually place in the Is It Lit RPG segment if it didn't already claim to be Lit RPG. I mean, I really struggled to believe that this was a Lit RPG book uh, in so very many ways. I just It was very hard for me to even conceive of this being a Lit RPG book. Uh, the book was a bit of a mess, and I'm not really sure what it wanted to do. Uh, so please allow me to elaborate on what the book is about before I go any further. The book centers on a protagonist who's in jail. Now, the lad has some anger issues centering on his father who abandoned him and his mother and is given a mysterious, I'm sorry, he's giving an out. He's given an out of jail by a mysterious psychiatrist who offers to have him play a game called Kaiju Wars in exchange for an early release. Now, he only gets out to find his mother is dying of ALS, you know, Lou Gehrig's disease. And man, Lou Gehrig, you want to talk about Typhoid Mary? This dude has whacked more people than anybody I've ever heard of. I mean, he's even gotten to Stephen Hawking. They should have, like, locked that cat up and, like, put him in a bubble so he didn't spread germs around. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, uh, he realizes that with her having ALS... She doesn't have long to live. Not long at all. Uh, and she is going into a decline as the book goes on. You can see she's in a steady decline. Uh, he is therefore forced to go to college uh, uh, in order for his absentee now returned father to pay for her upkeep care and maintenance, medically and uh, in every other way. Uh, at school, much as he doesn't want to go, you know, he is... A uh, paroled inmate, he, but he didn't want to go to college in the first place, and now he has to go. In school, he gets a chump for a roommate uh, who hits upon, and, and you know, he he saves him from getting beat up in the in the hallways because you know that's just all college is. No one really. I don't know. I've been to college. I've lived in college dorms, and I've never had people doing the stuff that they said that they did there. But that's just me. Um, uh, anyway. Uh, and, you know, he kind of meets this hot chick who's friends with his despised cousin. 
Now, his cousin is named Lusitania, who has to be named after the ship, so there's no way there's any symbolism there. Wink, wink, nod, nod. Uh, she is a total witch. And I don't mean she has magical powers. I just mean that if you take that W and do some plier work and do some bending with it, there's another word you get out of it. Uh, that's what she is. She's a total skanky witch uh, who just lives to make his life as miserable as she possibly can. Now, needless to say, needless to say that the protagonist becomes antagonistic a lot and finds that his sessions in the game, Kaiju Wars, help him to control his aggression. And things are pretty cool until he has to find a Kaiju, fight a Kaiju on his own turf. And that's where things kind of flip. So several things. First of all, in spite of the reasoning behind him going to school, there is no way I can see a guy that professes so much love for his mother who would leave her and go to her place where he could not get to her super fast and easily if there was a problem. Just no way I can see it. Secondly, even if his dad said, I'll pay for everything, I don't see him saying that he would pick a school close by if it came down to it, okay? Secondly, the book is about as lit as a wet cigar stub. And here's my beef, all right? Where's the beef? It's right here. The gameplay takes a backseat to the real world. And in every way, shape, or form, the real world, it, real world issues take precedence over game issues. In fact, there are no game issues because all he does is show up, sees a giant monster, smash some stuff, crush some stuff, fight some tanks till he gets killed. That's the game over and over and over again until they end up getting a couple missions. And basically it's a mission such as go and destroy the Capitol building in conjunction with all the other stuff that's around it. That's the game. That is absolutely the game, okay? So everything else kind of takes a back seat. Now, the MC, it just drives me crazy, I have to even say this, levels a whole lot without you ever seeing it happen. Uh, and, and that is just something, it's just, it's a travesty. You should never rob your readers of watching the progression of your character in any way. You should be there from level one to level 100. As they go through it, you should never be like, we came back two weeks later and suddenly he was set, you know, level 75. That's just, it does not fly with me. I feel ripped off because when you do that, okay, when you do that, you know, when you don't see the MC leveling up and, and he jumps levels with just by saying that he's done that, there's a big problem because part of the lit RPG genre itself is seeing the progression and learning the game world along with the player okay i had no connection to this game world which you know spoiler it's not really a game world okay just i'm gonna get that out there uh, you'll know it i mean i i felt that as soon as he got there i was like yeah this is not what he thinks it is uh it's just it's too too um too obvious or whatever but you you get ripped off of having that experience there is no game experience other than to smash this up break it and tack and, and there's not really like you know yeah okay they have game mechanics but they're pretty few and far between they talk about stats and special abilities but they don't really explain much like how do they work <clears throat> even once he does get his special ability that you don't know about it, whether he's going to get or not uh, and, um, I, that's not a spoiler it's just something you know is going to happen because they say it's going to happen um it never really explains, you know, how he can improve it other than it just it just activates during this period. So, you know, it's not like you, you get this ability to do this shout for taunts and you can see that, you know, you can uh, draw in more mobs as time goes on if you do this or this. That doesn't do that here. He just has a special ability. It activates. It does its job, and it's done. And it's that way with each of the other kaiju characters. They have a special ability, but they don't have a way to um, change it or you know tweak it in any way, shape, or form. It's just basically this is the way things are, and that just is completely against the lit RPG motto in my 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 heart. Okay, um, so it's 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 just like this. The fights in the game seem more like something out of a Godzilla movie rather than Tron or even Scott Pilgrim. You know, those were more game lit than this book, Scott Pilgrim and Tron. Now, this would actually be a fine straight kaiju book, 
where, you know, this happens and he goes into it. And if you took away the gaming elements, it would really be just an okay kaiju book. It would have worked just as well and would probably have been better because I feel really ripped off over the lack of the lit RPG elements, even though it claims it is lit RPG. And I'm I'm going to be honest with you. I am really one of those guys that I'm a live and let live thing. You know, if you want to call it something, that's fine. I'm not going to beat you over the head and say, no, this isn't it. But... You know, when you say that it's this is one thing and you don't really give a whole lot of effort into making it so, I'm going to just say, you know, I feel like I got ripped off because I would have never gotten this book if it didn't have the little RPG, you know, stamp of approval on it. Uh, and that's what I wanted. That's what I got. Um, and, and, you know, and, and really, I hate to even say that, you know, you know, that this, this would even come close to being like a, a riff on the arcade game Rampage. Rampage, a game that I sacrificed many a quarter to in my youth, um, you know, had to rage bars and, and things like that. Uh, and so I can see where, you know, some of this came from. But I can't even say it feels like that. It, it just does not have that that feel. Uh, and I'm sure that's exactly what he was trying to go for. Uh, it just does not feel lit RPG to me at all. The ending was not a shocker. In fact, it's something you really expect since there are more, more books to come. I just did not think this was, you know, amazing. I think it was pretty by the numbers. It was pretty predictable. Uh, the narration was not subpar. It was just about par. I was not blown away, nor was I amazed. But I can't say I was disappointed. I was just kind of like, he's reading the story. It came across as a decent first effort. I'll give it a C plus if you were asking me to grade it. But nothing, nothing will make me look for more work by Ethan Chessie. Um, I just did not think that it, it was a worthwhile thing for me to even go and see what else he's done. Um, I just was not amazed or even even slightly intrigued by anything else he could do. And, and, and this is just a, a, a huge factor in how the book came off to me. If it Maybe if it had been a different narrator, I might have liked this book a little bit more. But I just felt this was somebody who was feeling their way through, uh, you know, their first time or their second time or maybe their tenth time. And, you know, they're kind of like lost in a forest and they're, they're, they're feeling their way through it. And they were more worried about getting the technical stuff right than the story stuff. The voices, the inflections, the emotions, they all came out as okay. Uh, and it was simply stiff reading, and it hurt the tone of the book. I don't know how to say it any other way. I, I really do not think I'll be going on with this series, because I really didn't care about the narration. I didn't care about the the main character. I hated Lusitania. <coughs> Excuse me. And the other characters in the book either went away or, you know... The, the kaiju that were there didn't really have overwhelmingly big parts. Uh, and I'm just going to say it. Being in a game does not guarantee that you're in the RPG zone at all. It just does not. My final score for this book, I'm very sad to say. Uh, you know, I try to be really nice sometimes. And in this one here, it really put me off. And I'm just saying it drove me to a point where I was just waiting for something to, like, you know, have more lit RPG stuff come in at the end before the, the, the story closed. And it never happened. It never, never happened. So I was not very happy. The story had no life in the reading. It has some predictability issues. I mean, honestly, see if you can't guess who the PKer is two seconds after they figure out they're getting PK'd. And if it does just not feel like lit to me. You might like it, but it left a giant footprint in my eardrum when it was finished. Better narrator might have saved this book, but my final score is 6.9 stars. The sound booth spotlight for the day is Life Reset EVP Environment vs. Player by Shemmer Kuznets, narrated by Jeff Hayes, Lori Catherine Winkle, Annie Ellicott, with a book length of 21 hours and 53 minutes. VI seating complete, Vic informed me unnecessarily. I could feel the power of the creature's presence for myself, causing my danger sense to tingle. Welcome to the Green Pair! The ogre had wrapped his ham-sized hand around my neck and lifted me effortlessly to his eye level. I be the champion, he declared with copious spraying of ogre spit. His enunciation of the words was surprisingly clear. For an ogre, 
You serve the champion now. Go, find more fights for me, and bring me much food and females. Oh, hell no. This wasn't going well at all. I thought you said he wouldn't challenge me, I projected accusingly at Vic. I said a chief or a mage would challenge you for leadership of the clan. This brute is just having a pissing contest with you. So, you know, out piss him or whatever you meet suits do with your piss to resolve conflicts. So like I just said, this is this week's sound booth spotlight. And man, it was so fun. Practically 22 hours of gobliny goodness to gnaw on. Oren, the MC, returns... Uh, who, if you recall in the last book, he is trapped in a game world uh, and is a goblin dread totem who is running a goblinish village. I call it goblinish because it now has hobgoblins and ogres and a couple other things in there as well. Uh, you might remember the gremlins from the first book. Well, they've, they've made a reappearance. And then there's a couple other things sprinkled in throughout. Uh, <clears throat> the book plays out a lot like the original Warcraft uh, game, Orcs vs. Human. Humans. Uh, he creates, you know, Orin creates a lot of peons who do jobs assigned to them. They build and upgrade vital facilities for the advancement of the tribe. And they fight off invaders, you know, he has a limited militia that he uses to fight off invaders. I enjoyed this aspect of the book more than anything. And it's, it's crazy. Uh, you know, granted, I like watching Orin level up and getting new powers, but I really love to hear how he adds uh, you know, a new building or he upgrades one. And like I say, Tamer by, you know, MSE has my attention because the characters are building a fort. And the, this book really deals with tons of things happening to Orin in his village after the events of the first book have kind of settled down. And it seems that no matter what Orin does, <clears throat> nothing is going to prepare him for the trials that are ahead. But he can sure as heck try to get himself in a better position by putting up some buildings that he desperately needs done. Uh, Oren is in deep trouble, as his ex-guild members are looking for him now, uh, and he has limited time to prepare for their imminent arrival. To top it off, um, new monsters have begun showing up, and it seems... I'm sorry, not new monsters. New monster players have begun showing up, and one of them is a traitor. <clears throat> Somebody is going around ganking helpless goblins and stealing vital potion supplies. The urgency of the need to expand and gain experience and leveling Orin's troops is palpable. To top it off, uh, Orin now struggles <clears throat> to retain his identity as a simple player. He is forgetting he was ever human. He is slowly sinking more and more into his role as the Dread Totem and losing bits of himself in the process. It's really hard for him to keep himself himself more than anything. Uh, one of my favorite bits that got added in this time around is the mandible brain-eating Seneschal that made me kind of envision um, a hobgoblin-y predator. You know, they have these little mandibles and stuff. Um, he was a really fun character. And Kuznets uses him very effectively to demonstrate the importance and dangers of rep reputation in a really slick way. And that's one of the things that I really liked the most was the way that he took a simple concept like reputation and flipped it uh, for a, a completely unforeseen, uh, never-before-used, tricky kind of way of doing it. I mean, it was just really slick. It was smooth. It was smart. And that is the kind of stuff that I, as a reader or as a listener, appreciate because it's something I have not seen before. <clears throat> Another very impressive thing is the way how SBT handled this book. Last go around, Jeff Hayes did the whole thing himself. And now he's added in some of the sound booth ladies into the mix, but he wisely keeps himself on the voices that he did the last time. And that is a selling point for me because if suddenly, and I, and I hate to say it as much as I love Annie and Lori, um, <clears throat> if suddenly, you know, one of them were doing, you know, Tika's voice or, you know, uh, the old lady who does the potions and I can't think of her mind off the top of my head, it just would not be the same. Uh, you know, Jeff kept his people that he had done. He didn't, didn't shuffle them off into their hands and it works so much better that way. The way that he's done this. Because Annie and Lori both bring their A-game, and the Sisters of Sound Booth supercharge their story with sublime storytelling. 
I mean, they just, they really rock the house. And I think that if they had been doing his characters, I would have been very distracted and a little bit miffed because I really am one of these people that say, if you've done it this way, don't change horses midstream. And as much as I hate to say that kind of crap, because it's just crap saying that sort of stuff, it's the truth. You know, you don't say, well, you know, I don't want to do this anymore, and, and so I'm going to just hand this off. You know, you know, and I'm not putting anything against them if they do stuff like that. I'm a, I'm a person that likes things as they are and leaving them be. You know, if you, you have a really horrible, horrible narrator, I can understand changing them out. Uh, there's just some places, uh, you know, some books that you go to that the narration just destroys the book. And I think really good books. I've had a couple books that I would have probably really liked. But the narration was so horrible. Just so horrible. Uh, and, and so here, you know, they kept everything on pace with the way it was and only added to the meal. Uh, you know, it was it was like they flavored the whole story with their parts. They didn't take away, you know. So the super great stew that you had this last time, is even better because they added more to it. They didn't take out chunks and try to replace, you know, beef with tofu. And that's what I'm getting to. Uh, <clears throat> you know, Jeff is the man, and he is handling more characters than a, a juggling guillotine operator during the French Revolution. You know, I just don't know how he does it, but he has an impeccable pacing, and he knows, and try to say that three times real fast, impeccable pacing. Uh, he knows how to wrap a chapter up or add life into a battle scene. I mean, he just, just, for him, it's instinctive. I really have to say it's instinctive. He definitely infuses a sense of urgency into everything that Oren does. And he kind of lets Oren's smugness play out oh so very well that you kind of cringe when Oren says something so snide uh, that you know whatever it is he just said is going to come back to bite him on the rump in some capacity. And one thing that sort of surprised me was that Jeff didn't figure out a way to add sound effects to the shadow magic. I would have loved to have heard like a, a light wind or a full breeze kind of uh, SFX whenever he did his shadowy stuff. That would have added to it. And I'm not taking, saying anything negative about it because they do always. They add in a lot of sound effects and elements to their stuff. I just think that would have been like a really cool way to demonstrate that he's he's in his shadow form you know as as he's going through you just hear this quiet in the background uh to to illustrate that he was in shadow form uh <clears throat> now Oren, um that's just that's just my personal desires that you know he would do that with Oren. sbt just really nailed this book down and provided some top notch quality narration i'm really happy with it uh the the story itself it's just wonderful from start to finish. Uh, it has a point. It has a big battle. It has struggles. He, he gains new abilities. Everything that you want in a book, it does. It has a start and a middle and a finish. And it's exciting. It's not like just blah, blah, blah. As he goes through, he upgrades weapons. He upgrades his village. He has horrible things happen. You know, there's no torture scene <laughs> <laughs> there's literally there's no torture scene in this but i think uh shemner uh, he he, he kind of gives a nod to the 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 stomach uh turning quality some of the people took from the first book because he has um in one of the buildings they get a torture room and he's kind of like well i don't think we'll ever be using this just as a nod you know and <laughs> had a chuckle when he pulled that one out uh because it was kind of funny the way he did it uh but yeah i mean i just think that uh, I like that Cousin doesn't spit out shorter books. And then he knows the proper thing to do is to put his M3, MC through the ringer as often as possible. The narration is on a nuclear level, uh, and the overall story is fun and fast-paced. Uh, and it, it's just a struggle uh, to become stronger and prepare for a point when the PCs will invade the village. That's just, from start to finish... You can just see the uphill battle. You can feel the uphill battle. And when it finally comes, then you're like, oh my God, it's the final battle. And they're screwed. Uh, this book is slick and smooth, exciting. And it will sucker you in for more hours than you realize. Like, you know, I, I kind of power through my, you know, uh, audiobooks. You know, this one took me 
you know, two days to do it because there's 20 plus hours in it. So I couldn't do it all in one day, you know, as much as I tried. But I got pretty dang close. I got pretty dang close. Uh, and even when I lay down for bed, I, you know, I, I use my audible timer and give myself 15 minutes uh, before I fall asleep. And I laid down and listened to it for 15 minutes and then said, I think I'll listen to it again, and, you know, another 15 minutes. And I, I would close my eyes and get into the story. And I'm like, well, I can listen to her another 15 minutes. And I haven't slept for two days, but I'm still doing this. Even though I'm exhausted, I'm listening to the story, right? So that's how I know this was a really good book because it suckered me in and it made me keep listening. Even though I knew I'd be up in a few hours and being able to listen to it again and finish it off. I wanted to see what was going to happen because every time it would get to a point, it was always a point that something different, new, and exciting happened, and you wanted to see what was going on. So, you know, this is just a top-notch book all the way around. Get this book. You'll enjoy it. My final score is 8.3 stars, and that's only because, the, you know, as good as it was, there were some things that just about Oren... I kind of got tired of hearing about how he was slipping into the, the the PC role where he was becoming a player character instead of being, you know, a character, you know, a player. Um, so, you know, that was kind of just like, I get it. He's in danger and he's, he's falling. That kind of bothered me a bit. But, I mean, it's still, this is just really, really a fun, exciting book. And I really like Kuznet's writing styles. And I think his style matches so well with Jeff Hayes and Sound Booth. Uh, Hayes really is it's one of those books where I can say, this feels to me like it's a Hayes book. From start to finish, the minute it goes, I could tell you that Jeff Hayes would read this book and kill it. And that's exactly what happens here. 8.3 stars, you will not regret it, you will not be disappointed, and you'll want to get the next book, even though it doesn't even exist yet. So that's just the only downside to it. You're going to want something that you can't get. Story of my life. Okay. Anyway, thank you all for listening, and we'll go on to the next. So, this week, I'm doing another Is It Lit RPG or Not? Uh, but I'm not going to focus on one book. I'm going to focus on four. I'm going to do the entire series. I think that if I've read the entire series, I'm going to tell you about the entire series as I do this, because this one especially, um, and I hope you'll understand this later on, it works much better if I tell you the whole concept in one shot rather than book by book. Um, what I'm doing is, it is called The Four Lords of the Diamonds by Jack L. Chalker. It is narrated by Kirby Hayborn. And the book's length run from 10 to 12 hours, a little bit over 12 sometime. Uh, the first book is called A Wolf in the Fold, Cerberus. The second is Lilith, A Snake in the Grass. The third is Charon, uh, a dragon at the gate, and the fourth is Medusa, a tiger by the tail. Uh, now, for this segment, like I said, it, it's I know it's not how it's usually done, but I think it works so much better this way. So, just give me a few seconds here, and we'll go right in. Then the four lords are selling us out, the young man sighed. Why not simply destroy all four worlds? Good riddance anyway, I'd say. So would I, Commander Kraga agreed. Only we can't. We let them go on too long. They're politically invulnerable. Too much wealth, too much power, too many secrets are there. There is simply no way to get them anymore. They have the goods on just about anybody who would be high up enough to make those decisions. The young man cleared his throat. I see, he responded a little disgustedly. So why not place agents on those worlds? Find out what's what. Oh, that was tried from the first, Craig told him. It didn't work either. Consider, we're asking someone to exile himself permanently and allow himself to be turned, equally permanently, into something not quite human. This is a pretty slick sci-fi series that I think was way ahead of its time. Uh, the story revolves around four planets that have been discovered in the distant quadrant of the galaxy. Now, mankind has kind of been spreading itself out amongst the stars, and they colonize every planet that is habitable. The only thing is that these four worlds that are discovered have something really strange about them, and it makes it impossible for you to leave once you enter the diamond, 
uh, name for a solar system that holds the four planets because once every so often they line up in a diamond formation around the sun <clears throat> as they rotate. Um, you'll see that the, these worlds hold these tiny little mindless creatures called wardens. Uh, wardens flood the cells of your body once you enter the system of the planet, I should say, um, and they change you. They instantly change you. Uh, they improve your body. They do make a lot of changes, give you certain abilities, but you cannot leave the system itself. After you get so far away from the four planets, you just die because the wardens inside your body die, and they are what keep you alive. And that is what makes this a perfect place for uh, the, the spacefaring government called the Confederacy to send all of their political dissidents, all of their prison, you know, their, their, their super smart criminals, people who they want to keep alive so they can use their minds, you know, their brains, pick their brains for things, but they can't do anything to the Confederacy because once they go there, they're trapped. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, if you're sick, for example, and you go into the warden system, you're pretty much cured within a few hours. Uh, and they, they, they really give you these really cool superpowers. Each planet gives you a different power. And once you go to your first planet, that is the power you're stuck with. Sorry, so if you don't like it, too bad, so sad. You can't change powers by going to different planets. Uh, each one has different abilities, and I'll go into all that a little bit later. Uh, like I said, they're planet-specific, and they only tend to work for newcomers. Uh, you know, long-time natives, people who have been there generation after generation, see their skills fading over time. They're no longer as powerful. So once you've acclimated to it, once you're, you know, your, your children have been there or your children's children, the warden's powers fade. So they need new blood to come in and keep their, their hierarchy, uh, you know, their governments, those sorts of things running because that's a necessity for them. The way the wardens work make this such an ideal prison, prison system that, you know, only the worst of the worst of the worst make it there. Uh, and that means that each planet in the system is run by the nastiest, smartest, most self-centered people you can find in the galaxy, which is bad news for the Confederacy um, because these people are so smart. So you know if you're sending like geniuses to a place and they're going to populate the planet, you're going to get a planet full of geniuses after a while. And they tend to be able to outthink regular people. Uh, so just bear that in mind. Either way, um, the Confederacy soon discovers that there is a massive conspiracy going on in the Diamond System that may or may not just involve some aliens. Either way, they know there's a massive threat to their way of life. So what they do is they, they figure out they're going to send in their top assassin to infiltrate all four worlds and discover the threat and stop what's ever going on. Well, how are they going to do that, you ask? Since once you go to a planet, you're pretty much marked and can only use the abilities of that planet from that point forth. Well, the Confederacy has this thing called the Merton Process, in which they can record your mind and download it into other people's bodies permanently. So in Matrix style, they can also include like, you know, more information that gets downloaded into, you know, the MC's head, uh, such as maps and data about each planet. And the way this works is the nameless assassin will sit just outside of the warden system in a picket ship and receive mental uploads from each of his doppelgangers. The plan is for his mind to override one prisoner on each plan uh, transport that's going to different planets by the Merton process once they go to the restroom. They sit down on the toilet. This thing comes over their head. They get wiped. He gets uh, uploaded into their body, and then he takes it from there. It's his job to then figure out what's going on on the world he heads to. And this is all well and good until some of his duplicates get a little upset that they are permanently trapped and that he gets to sit in the sky and kind of piece things together and you know solve the big mysteries. And, and you know, so they get a little mad about this. And needless to say, not all the duplicates stay true to their assignment. Not all survive. And they don't always do what you expect. They don't always succeed in the way that you would think they would. The only real downside to the book series is that there is a massive formula. And one that can be a little bit maddening. 
Uh, basically, after the initial break-in for each story, there'll be an event, and then you'll have the the assassin who takes the code name Lewis Carroll. Uh, and if you listen to the names of the moons of some of the planets, you'll see that he, the Jack Chalker kind of used some, you know, Lewis Carroll stuff in the book is, is kind of just some Easter eggs. Um, but the formula can just drive you crazy because you get the start and then you have the upload and the upload is taken almost verbatim from the first book. So you have four times, in, you know, for the whole series, the same things being said repeatedly. The only variations or changes are, you know, um, basically what happens once he's uploaded into the new body, because each body is different. One's really huge, one's really small, so on and so forth. And the information he gets on the planet itself that he's going to, because each planet is separate and alone. So he gets, you know, stats on the planets and that sort of thing. Uh, I seriously recommend just listening to find out how each person is uploaded uh, and then moving on to when he arrives at the planet after you've listened to the first book. You're not going to miss a whole heck of a lot. But if you want to, you can read through it. And, you know, if you like repetitions about stats and populations and planet temperatures and locations of cities. Now, I've read these books enough that I jump over it all because it can be a bit boring, you know, after you've, you've done this a dozen times or so. And as I said, each planet provides different powers. One of those planets, you swap bodies. Uh, and another, you physically adapt to the environment. So, you know, if you go into the water, you're going to breathe water. If you, you know, um, go into the sun, you're going to adapt so that you don't dehydrate and so on and so forth. There's a lot of different things that happen. Uh, another one allows you to physically uh, cast spells on, you know, people. You can cast, you, know, you can do magic. Or you can literally reshape the world around you with a thought. Each book is extremely, extremely interesting and slowly reveals what the conspiracy is, why it's there, what's going on. And you don't really get the big picture until the very last moment. And that's one of the things I really liked about this. Uh, it's not one of those things where you piece it together in the first book and you just watch it unfold. No, I mean, there are puzzle pieces that are this big, uh, you know, and you got to put them into, into the right slot the first time. I still don't think you'll see the ending coming, uh, what really is going on. <clears throat> Eventually you learn, you know, the purpose of the wardens and how the lords of the diamonds, you know, the criminals who run each world, are striking back at the Confederacy. And in spite of being recorded in 2013, the narration is really surprisingly good. It is crisp and clean, and Kirby Haywood does different voices for the characters. He adds a lot of pace to it. He adds a lot of emotion to it. I liked it, and I, I, I that's what I expect from a narrator. And, and then I realized he's vocalized almost 500 books, hitting a majority of genres, and he's still working in this field to this day. So the man has some really, really good skills. He knows how to narrate. So this is not you know, a weak point at all for these books. Haywood really, really carries these books on his shoulders. Because, you know, his Cal Tremon voice is way different than his Park voice. Uh, you know, and when you go through him, you'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about. He, he has different voices for different people. But basically, the, the, the book series is set up in such a formula where, you know, you get uploaded. He gets to the planet. He finds a girlfriend. He goes on the run. Uh, he encounters the boss or the, you know, the bigwig in some capacity. And then something happens. Uh, and that's the formula that I was talking about. Each book does that all the way down the line. There's no escaping it. There's no getting around it. That's just the way it is. It, but it doesn't detract from the story. Uh, I really, really like this story. Now, here's where we get to the meat and taters of the whole thing. The series is fraught, and I mean fraught with lit overtones. The main character uploads his mind into a computer and wakes up in a new world with powers he's never experienced. Check. Powers that he has to figure out to how to use. Check. And if he figures out figures it out, he needs to level up as quickly as possible. Hmm, this is beginning to sound really strange. 
He also has a quest to discover and stop, if possible, a threat to his own world. Again, quest, leveling, powering, uh, going into a new world, trapped, okay? Uh, given that the different protagonists all slowly level their powers and actually become different people from their base template, makes this feel a lot like a portal theme coupled with a trapped in the game feel, okay? Additionally, the Nameless Assassin has an AI companion who helps him navigate through the clues, but doesn't necessarily really want to work on his behalf. It works for the Confederacy, so he can't trust his AI. Does this begin to sound any way, shape, or form lit at all? I mean, you know, they don't have HP, and, and, and no, they, they don't have health bars, and they don't do that sort of thing. But, I mean, if you look at the spirit of this, you can see where I'm going. So you have a semi-helpful AI portal plus trapped in the game, so to speak, uploading into the computer, getting powers, having to level up, coupled with a quest that is wrought with opposition, danger, weird alien creatures, and a time limit. And I have to say that while this technically isn't lit RPG, it sure as hell looks, smells, and feels like it. This is probably the most lit RPG series that you will find that isn't lit RPG. Honestly, each of the four worlds has its own set of rules, abilities, and challenges that makes it feel like different kinds of gaming worlds. I really love this series, and I'm going to call it lit. Yes, it is absolutely lit RPG. If you look at it, this is written before the genre happened, and if it had been out, I'm telling you now, uh, he would have included aspects of that in here because this is so close, so close, and especially with the AI. That, that, that computer is so much like, like a companion that you have who, you know, balks the main character in stupid ways and annoys him or her in their quest. That alone just sealed it for me when I when I was thinking about this, because there is so many ways that you know I could have said this strays here or there, it goes off, or it comes close. But I mean, like I said, you look at it, it hits so many different points to make this lit. If it's not lit, it's sure as hell game lit, and I'm still calling it close enough. Uh, and this is one of my most loved series. I have it in actually four different formats now. I have it in paperback, on Kindle, on audio, and on MP3 audio CDs. So I think you'll figure that I really enjoyed this series. This is one of my favorite book series, favorite sci-fi series. Uh, so you won't be sorry you checked it out. Like I say, I am going to call this lit. I'm not going to give it a score. Uh, from now on, I'm just going to say yes or no for lit. And, you know, that's it. And I'm going to introduce the, you know, what else have they done as Here's a story. I'm introducing it. I enjoyed it. Take your chances and, and see what you know what you think. So here, I'm going to say 100%. This is as close as you can get without actually having stats. Okay. So enjoy this book series. I really recommend it. It is really exciting and fun. And I can't tell you how many times I've read this series. I cannot. It's just not physically possible. Cause I, I've done it so much. Uh, <clears throat> There are just certain things that you just don't want to miss. This is one of those. Well, everybody, thank you oh so very, very much for watching. I do appreciate you taking the time to watch or listen to the show. And if you want to support us, you can like the Lit RPG podcast Facebook page or the YouTube page or just like and share the video. I really sincerely hope that you've enjoyed the show. Please leave comments or suggestions in the section below. And feel free to, you know, tell me whatever you like or what you don't like. Uh, I, and I enjoy the feedback, honestly. I really do. And don't forget, the first five people who make a mention in the comments of YouTube below, I will send them out free codes for the Conquest book by Mr. Chow. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. Remember, please leave a review for any book that you've listened to or read. Authors really, really depend on those reviews. It helps them, you know, it helps them a lot. And it would be deeply appreciated if you could do that for them. For the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast, I'm Ray. Keep listening.